Well, good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you for being here this morning, and thank you for your continued giving to Central. We're so appreciative of your faithfulness to this body of Christ. Uh, Pastor Doug and Sister Pam are in West Virginia this uh, weekend at a, at a wedding. Um, and so just a couple announcements on the way of announcements. Uh, tonight, uh, there are no light group meetings, so no light group meetings tonight at the church. And then uh, men's meeting is this Tuesday at 6.30. Uh, I'm going to actually be meeting in the sanctuary, and there was a text that went out saying otherwise, but men's meeting this Tuesday at 6.30 in the sanctuary. So I want to open this morning with reading to you Psalms 34. Lord, I'm busting with joy over what you've done for me. My lips are full of perpetual praise. I am boasting of you and all your works. So let us let all who are discouraged take heart. Join me, everyone. Let's praise the Lord together. Let's make him famous. Let's make his name glorious to all. Listen to my testimony. I cried to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Gaze upon him. Join your life with his, and joy will come. Your faces will glisten with glory. You'll never wear that shame-faced mask again. Just kidding. That's a joke. It says you'll never wear that shame face again. When I had nothing, desperate and defeated, I cried out to the Lord, and he heard me, bringing his miracle deliverance when I needed it the most. The angel of the Lord stooped down and listened as I prayed, encircling me, empowering me, and showing me how to escape. He will do this for everyone who fears God. Drink deeply of the pleasures of God. Experience for yourself the joyous mercies he gives to all who turn to hide themselves in him. Worship in awe and wonder all you who've been made holy. For all who fear him will feast with plenty. Even the strong and wealthy grow weak and hungry, but those who passionately pursue the Lord will never lack anything good. The Lord is close to all whose hearts are crushed by pain, and he is always ready to restore the repentant one. Even when bad things happen to the good and the godly ones, the Lord will save them and not let them be defeated. By what they face, they will not be defeated. God will be your bodyguard to protect you when trouble is near. Not one bone will be broken, but the wicked will commit slow suicide, for they hate and persecute the lovers of God. Make no mistake about it. God will hold them guilty and punish, punish them. They will pay the penalty. But the Lord has paid for the freedom of his servants, and he will freely pardon those who love him. He will declare them free and innocent when they turn to hide themselves in the Lord. Will you stand with me this morning as we open, as we go into the Lord to the worship him? Heavenly Father, we come here this morning to exalt you and to worship you. Father, you created human beings for friendship, for fellowship, so that we can show back and worship to the one who created us. And so, Father, we exalt you this morning. We lift up our arms and we praise you. Be thou exalted this day, O Lord. So I was reading in uh, Proverbs 30, if you want to turn there. There's just Proverbs 30, 1 through 3. And um, it intrigued me uh, with some scripture there. And so... The, the title of the message today is, is Life Everlasting. Life Everlasting. And so I want to walk you through. Uh, uh, God created us in his image, and we're going to look at that in the beginning, in Genesis. And then what takes place in the middle. And then in the end, in Revelation. And then we're going to, and then we're going to walk into communion together, Okay. So in Proverbs 30, verses 1 through 3, now there are three names here, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing them correctly. Um, you know, you can listen to audio Bible and see how to pronounce these words, and when you listen to each audio Bible, it's like each one pronounces it differently. So I'm not quite sure how to say it, but I know they roll their R's, they, they cough their K's, and you know, and I'm not going to attempt to do that this morning with you. But in your Bible, you can see the names, and the names will be on the screen there with, for you as well. But it reads in Proverbs 30, 1 through 3. 
These are the collected sayings of the prophet Agur, Jacob's son, the amazing revelation he imparted to Ithiel and Yukal. God, I am so weary and worn out. I feel more like a beast than I do a man. I was made in your image. I'm lacking understanding. I'm yet to learn the wisdom that comes from the full and intimate knowledge of you, the Holy One. I think they have the New Living Translation up there, but I'm reading from the Passion Translation just for this verse. God, I'm so weary and worn out. I feel more like a beast than a man. Can anyone relate to what it was before COVID? The stress that was there before COVID, right? Like before COVID, everybody said, man, life is so stressful. Life is so stressful. And there's so many things pressing against me. Stress is an outward force pushing in. The word stress originated from wood, timber, lumber. Stress was the wood that they would stress it to see how when it would snap. And, and so it's an outward force pressing in. But now we talk of more stress as being the intensity of a mutual force or a physical, chemical, or emotional factor that causes bodily or emotions intensifying even to the point of causing diseases, stress. I feel more like a beast than I do a human. I, I, I can't even put together my emotions and my feelings. As you have the prophet here speaking to his protégés, Ithiel and Yuko, and he says that, God, you created me in your image. I'm still lacking understanding and I'm yet to learn the wisdom that comes from the full and intimate knowledge of you. Now, you know, in Old Testament and in biblical times, words for names, the names and the meanings of the names were very prevalent. They've meant a lot. Even today, sometimes you name people to mean something. And so if you look on the slide, I think they created the slides today. Agar means to gather harvest. Jacob means blameless or obedient. Ithio can mean God is with me or God has arrived. And of course, that has happened through the fulfillment of Christ by his birth. You call can mean that I am able or I am strong and mighty. So when you place the meaning of these Hebrew names together, it could read like this. Gather a harvest of sons who are blameless and obedient. They will have God with them and they will be strong, strong and mighty. Gather a harvest of sons who are blameless. We are made blameless through the blood of Jesus Christ. Gather a harvest of sons who are blameless and obedient. They will have God with them and they will be strong and mighty. Folks, that is you and I. That is you and I who has God with us and we are strong and we are mighty through Christ. So I was, as I was reading Proverbs 30 here and it says that I was made in your image. Of course, it took me back to Genesis chapter 1 through 3 where God created man. And so let me brief you through Genesis 1 through 3, and I would encourage you this afternoon or the next, over the next couple of days, read through Genesis 1 through 3. This is um, embarrassing. And I'm going to blame it on the light. Okay. So, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he separated the, the heavens, the earth. He created light. It says that he brought forth grass and seeds and 
the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. Each day after God created something, it says that it was good. He stepped back at the end of each day and said, it is good. And so he created the sun, which created time, which created seasons. And so if you think about that, if the sun is time and in heaven God creates the light, there is no sun, so there must not be any time. I just think it's a beautiful thing. Talk about stress. Take away time. How less stressful could it be? So God created the living creatures, the cattle, the creeping things, the beasts of the earth. And then he said, let us create man. Then God said, let us, and that's capital U-S, us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image, capital O-U-R. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc., etc. And then on the sixth day, it says that God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. I love, it's good, it's good, it's good, all the way through. And then he steps back in his majesty and he says, it is very good. And that's after he created humans, male and female, you and I. I just think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing there. And so you know the story. So there is life in the garden. God planted the garden of the eastward side, the garden of Eden. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. And the other tree that is mentioned in the garden is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I want you to remember the tree of life, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Also, it says there, now there was a river that went out of Eden and it flowed into several other, it broke off into several other different rivers. And then God said, and took man, then the Lord took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, because in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Now, I get a kick out of this, and this is just me. It says that then the Lord God said it is not good for man to be made alone and I'll make him a helper. It's almost like God was taking his characteristics and all those things about him. And so he created the human and he put it all into this man. And he said, this is very good. But then he stepped back and said, dude, you need a helper. You need somebody to complete you. I've got all this other characteristics and all this other creativity, all, all the vastness of myself. I'm going to take a piece of you and I'm going to create another human being, woman, because the two of you shall come together as one, male and female, include God, and it creates the perfect us, our Father, Son, Holy Spirit, male, female, and God. And he noticed that man needed another helper. There's more of me that I want to get out. So I have male and I have female, and they join together. I mean, I can say so much, my wife completes me. I don't know about you guys, but my wife completes me. I can say yay and amen to that scripture verse there. So that's what it means to me. I don't know. Maybe you're saying something else. Okay, about your wife, I don't know. But anyhow, you know that the temptation comes. And it says that the woman said to the serpent that, you know, yes, we were told to be in the garden and we can eat this and eat that. But then listen to what the serpent says to the woman. You will not surely die. Now that is a lie, right? Because it's God said, you're going to die. Now the rest of it is true. What the devil said the rest of the way is true. He said, for God knows that in the day you eat, of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. They from the tree of knowledge, knowing, coming to the knowledge of good, good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, it intrigues me throughout scripture how often it is 
recommended to us to continue to seek wisdom. And in the beginning, man, human, was seeking wisdom because they wanted to be ah, wise. She thought I would eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil so that I would be wise. So, of course, you know what happened. She ate of it. And so God created man. And just like you, when you do a hard day work or whatever, whatever, and you want to go home in your place, your home, your patio, your garden, your lawn, whatever you do, you go and you chill out. That's your space. That's your place. God's space and his place was coming to the Garden of Eden every evening to communicate with those humans that he created because he created the humans so that they would fellowship and communicate and honor him and worship him and give back gratitude and worship, worship to the one who created him. So this day when he came into the garden, the humans that he created didn't run out in excitement like your puppy dog or your kitty cat does to greet him and say, hello, God, how are you in the cool of the evening? We are here to fellowship you. What did they do? It says that the, the, the words of man, God says, hey, where are you guys? Hello, hello, what happened? Where are you? I mean, he already knew, but he said, what's going on? And they said, Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Do you understand? When man came to the knowledge of good and evil, fear, guilt, and shame entered the human race. Fear, guilt, and shame. Naked, afraid, naked, and hid. Fear, guilt, and and shame entered the human race. God didn't desire in the beginning when he created you to have fear, to have guilt, and to have shame. Do you know that guilt and shame take more people out than sin? Because guilt and shame is the way that people look at themselves and we as humans have such a tendency to be so hard on ourselves, guilt and shame wipe out more Christians than sin does because we're constantly pushing that against ourselves. God sees you through the opticals of grace and through his blood that washed you white as snow. And so it goes on to say, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. How did he become like one of us? Capital U.S., Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. Now lest he put out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Wait. Time out. It says, therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground. So he drove out the humans and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. He knew that the humans... They ate of the knowledge of the tree, uh, knowledge of good and evil, that they would then go back and eat from the tree of life. But it's like he said, wait, time out. I have another plan. I have another plan for the human race. So remember the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life. This is in the beginning as this began to take place. Now let's think what's taking place in the middle and then we'll look at the end, okay? So Paul says, consider the example that Jesus, the anointed one, has set before us. Let this mindset be your motivation throughout your life. The example of Jesus Christ. He existed in the form of God, yet he gave no thought to seizing equality with God as the supreme prize. So he became a human, but he didn't still try to be God. Or be... Instead, he emptied himself of his outward glory by reducing himself 
to the form of a lowly servant by becoming a human. He humbled himself and became vulnerable, choosing to be revealed as a man and was obedient. He was a perfect example, even in his death, a criminal's death by crucifixion. Because of the obedience, God exalted Jesus and multiplied his greatness. Jesus is in the multiplication business. If you're a Christian, multiplication is in your favor. If you look in Genesis, anything that procreated, produced, he blessed it, and then he blessed it with multiplication in your life. So no, not shame and guilt. God has a plan of multiplication for you in your life. He has now been given the greatest of all names. Jesus Christ has been given the name of all names. The authority of the name of Jesus causes every knee to bow in reverence. Everything and everyone will one day submit to his name in the heavenly realm, in the earthly realm, and even in the demonic realm. And every tongue will proclaim in every language that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he is ruler, bringing glory and honor to his Father. So each of us, as we're walking through life, we see in the beginning, but there's the middle and there's then the end. And we're all responsible, I believe, as Christians to share or let the light of Christ shine through us into other people's lives. And so some of you may know this, some of you may not, but I'm just going to briefly cover this, that there's this saying called the Roman road from the book of Romans. And you'll see on your screen there are three scripture verses that you can always go to. And this is talking about leading someone to Christ. So I don't know how you remember numbers, but you have Romans 3.23, 6.23, and 10.9. So 3 times 2 is 6. 6.23, 3.23. Take out the 2. 3 times 3 is 9. What comes after 9 is 10. I just left you into my brain. I don't know how you memorize stuff. Okay? But there you go. So Romans 3.23, 6.23, and 10.9. Very easy to remember. But let's look at them. And this is a good thing to write down. This is a good thing to remember. So when you talk to someone and you plant a seed in their heart and their mind about God's plan for them, the multiplication that he has for them, the everlasting life that he has for them. And I want every one of you here today who are here today or you're you're online watching that, that you know and that you are assured of your salvation so much that you're assured of it that you're equipped to share that with others. You know, we're sealed with the communion and with the power of the Holy Spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is that power that lives with inside of us. Romans 3.23 says that everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now that word sinned, is actually a sport, an archery, a military term. And it's talking about shooting like bow and arrow, okay? And so what it says about missed the mark, send, you've missed the mark. You've missed the bullseye. You've probably hit the target, but you just missed the bullseye. And so it's saying, like, listen, in everyday life of everyone, we're not perfect. Yes, we have tendencies where we need help and we maybe fall back a little bit, but we know that all have sinned and fallen short of that glory of God. But we have a perfect Savior in and through His blood and through the perspective of Him looking through the lenses of grace. He's made us perfect and we're seen to be perfect. Being perfect is an unreachable goal as a human. Don't strive for perfection. You'll never become it. But through the eyes of God, you are perfect because He sees you through the lens of His grace and His love. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. So in other words, sin equals death. Sin equals damnation. Sin equals the lake of eternal fire. It says in the Bible that it's like when you're in hell, it's like a canker worm. It's bitterness that continues to eat at you and that you're grinding your teeth in anger because you know you should have recognized him as Lord, as ruler. Can you imagine the agony and the pain and knowing I had an opportunity to not be here? I could have chosen life. P. 
Peter says that the Lord is not late in his promise of returning, as some think that he's being late, but rather his delay is simply revealing his loving patience towards us because he does not want any to perish but all to come to repentance. Keep in mind that our Lord's extraordinary patience simply means more opportunity for salvation. And the third part of the Roman road is Romans 10, 9. And what is it? And what is God's living message? God's living message is the revelation of faith for salvation, which is the message that we preach. For if you publicly declare with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will experience salvation. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you experience salvation. Deuteronomy, it says, listen, today I'm giving you a choice. A choice between life and death. Between prosperity, multiplication, or disaster. For I've commanded you this day to love the Lord your God. Keep his commandments, his decrees, and regulations by walking in his ways. If you do this, you will live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're about to enter and occupy. What is the land that we're looking to enter and occupy? Heaven? The New Jerusalem? Anybody with me? Today I've given you the choice between life and death. Between blessing or cursing. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would consider life so that you and your descendants might, might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God, by obeying Him and committing yourself firmly to Him. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will long in the land, the promised land that the Lord swore to give you and your ancestors between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we talked about in the beginning... What's taking place in the middle? An opportunity for salvation for everyone. Now let's talk about the end. We may be closer to the end than what we think. I don't know. But in Revelation 21, this was written by John the Apostle on the island of Patmos. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. The new heaven is the promised land. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Each of us are that husband. The bride is Christ. Have you prepared yourself for the coming bride, Jesus Christ? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There's going to be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. The former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, the indomitable, the murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Now, Revelation 22, it says, John says, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Guess where it was proceeding from? It was coming out of the throne of God and from the Lamb, Jesus. In the, midst, in the middle of the street and on either side of the river, 
there was a tree there called the tree of life. Remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? No, 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 no. My eternal life must come through another plan. My son, I'm going to put the tree of life for you in the heavenlies from my very throne, from the lamb. There's going to be a river flowing. And on the side of the river, there is this tree that you may now eat of. And it is the tree of eternal life. Have you received my son? Folks, there's a day coming when this song will be sung. The city is a stronghold for us. Jesus is our salvation that saves us and delivers us inside and out. Open the gates and let the righteous, faith-filled people enter in. Perfect, absolute peace surrounds and watches over those whose imagination and those whose thoughts are consumed with the Lord. They confidently trust in you, Lord. Yes, trust in the Lord forever and ever. The Lord, your God, is your rock. And when we say that the Lord, your God, is your rock, he is the enduring protection, safety, and security that we have in him. We plant our feet on the rock and find boldness and confidence through every age, through every season that you pass through in your life. God remains our faithful rock of all ages. As we prepare to take communion this morning, does everyone have the cup? And then we also produced for you with much cleanliness, a much better bread. Does anybody need it? Raise your hand. Or here's one that we need. Anybody else missing the cup this morning? And the bread? As we do this and reflect upon the Lord. I want to read you this morning a letter that was penned by Pastor Jimmy Evans. But he wrote this letter as if it is God speaking to you. So let me read this letter to you and take it personal as God is speaking directly to you about his love, okay? Dear children, I realize you have a difficult time understanding who I am because of mistakes your parents have made as well as the influence the fallen world has had on you. So that you can understand me, and remember, this is a letter from God to you personally. So that you can understand me and relate to me as I really am, first of all, I want you to know that I am very compassionate towards you. I don't just see what you're doing, but I see why you're doing it. You cannot change without my help. I can also see what the devil was doing as he's trying to attack you. I see what others have done to you in your past and even now. I wish that you would understand that I don't stand back and judge you. I want to be in your life helping you because I love you so much. I want you to know that my help is free. You, know, you do not have to deserve any of my help. My son died on the cross to die for all of your sins so that you can relate to me without merit and without performance. My throne is the throne of grace. All you have to do is believe in my love and ask for my help and it will be given to you generously and generously in every area of your life and very being. I will never desert you under any circumstance. I will be with you forever and never reject you. I am good natured and I never change. I am never in a bad mood or have a bad day. I am the most consistent person you will ever know. You can trust in me. 
I will always be good to you because I am overflowing with goodness that I want to share with you. My plan for your life, for your life's good, will never change. I will never lie to you, will never deceive you, will not trick you, will not hold information from you, and I will never break a promise to you. I will always relate to you based on the truth. I will always forgive you, and when you sin, I will totally remove your sin from your record. My grace is greater than all your sins combined, past, present, and future. My mercy towards you is renewed every day. As a father, I have rules there for you to protect you and to help you grow as a person and as a believer. If you violate my rules, I will deal with you graciously, even as I discipline you at times. My correction is motivated by my love for you. Never interpret my correction as anger or as rejection. I love you so much. I love you too much to allow you to damage yourself or others without attempting to help you and to get you to a better place. I love you more than you can know. In this life, my desire is to reveal my love to you personally each and every day. Child, believe these words because they are true. Act upon them as you pray to me and believe in me. For I give to you the mercy and grace that you need every day. And I'll reveal myself to you in a new way. Signed, your loving Father. Do you have your, your bread there this morning? You know, as Jesus was sitting at the table with the disciples... On the night before he was betrayed, he's sitting there looking at the 12 disciples, knowing 10 out of the 12 disciples would be martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Judas will hang himself, and then John will end up on an island and write to all of you the end of the story so that you have hope and that you can put your trust in him. No matter what you're facing, how large this pandemic is. It's like the pandemic of the coronavirus wasn't enough. Now we have another pandemic called the election. Are you kidding me? Like just, let's just keep piling it on, right? But our hope and our trust is in God, not in man, not in an election. Not in any person, but in Jesus Christ. Thank God for his love. Thank God for sending his son, for creating us in his image. On the night which he was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he says, remember me. Father, we stand here before you this morning. Lord, we remember you. We recognize you, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your vast love. We cannot even begin to measure the love that you have for us. But as we just read, Father, those whose minds are stayed upon you has perfect peace Father God, we take this bread this morning in remembrance of you. Will you take eat with me this morning? Thank you, Lord. And then in the same manner, he took the cup after they were all done eating. I'll give you half an hour. I'm about ready to just explode mine here. Here we go. Hey, you know, that's hard to open if the cracker ain't out. I'm just saying. Wow. Anyhow. Yeah. So there Jesus sits, looking at the 12 disciples, knowing the end of each life that will be lived, 
knowing the plan that he has for you, a plan of multiplication, a plan of blessing, a plan giving you hope. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many, shed for the remissions of sin. Thank God for his blood. Thank God that we are forgiven. Every time we mess up, we can just come back and say, God, I missed the bullseye. I missed it. Forgive me, Lord. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, that you see me through the eyes of grace. I thank you, Lord, that your blood washes us clear as crystal clear, white as snow, Father. Lord, we are so grateful and gracious to your love towards us. Father, as you said, do this as oft as you drink it. Again, Lord, we remember you in this. You partake with the blood with me this morning. Ricky has a great song that he's going to close us in. And so I want that to be our closing. If you would stand this morning and surrender yourself to the Lord. Maybe you've not felt you've been pressing on to the Lord as you should. Maybe you've never confessed Christ as your Lord or, and Savior. And you want to do that this morning. Take these moments as, as Ricky leads us and closes us out this morning. God bless you.